Thank you very much. Thank you for your very good for sitting there. Um, and thank you very much. I'm glad to be here in beautiful upstate New York. Um, last year the conference was in Syracuse, so I'm feeling very fortunate. I have another beautiful setting. Okay, so it's raining a little bit. That's all right. I'm from California. It's the last rain in California. So wherever I go, it's raining. So wherever I go, it's raining. Something to feedback? Or is that just my head? Right, I'll just keep talking. Um, so I, this is a great part of the state. My daughter lives in Boston, so I always have a take the opportunity to, to, to travel out here. Um, I can see all the beautiful trees, they're just on fire. It was, uh, it was wonderful. So thank you very much for the opportunity to come back and visit with you. Um, I, I'm going to begin with a little bit of disclaimer. I don't know if any of you read the blurb about my talk. On the, uh, is that showing up there? Um, just keep so I have to give a disclaimer. I don't know if any of you read the blurb about my talk. It was on the website, and it said that um, I was going to present or talk about some findings and conclusions from research, uh, recent research review that the National Research Council is conducting on the research on English language learning. This is actually the third such review in the past 20 years uh, that the National Research Council has sponsored. And it's sort of an interesting, I think somewhat useful exercise where they bring together scholars and presumably experts in research and practice on English language learners and they synthesize the research. The National Research Council does this for lots of domain. They do it in medicine, they do it in agriculture, they do it electronics and sort of synthesize the body of knowledge. So this is the third one. The first one was in the late 90s. Maybe you heard about the one that I was that I participated in the National Literacy Panel, which you know, mentioned. Unfortunately, it was supposed to appear in the fall of 2016, which is now, but it's not quite finished. So uh, it'll be out in the spring. Uh, you can actually download it if you're interested uh, from their website. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about that, but I will do my best to try to share with you some of my thoughts, impressions, and syntheses about research on English language learners, what we know, what we don't know, and what some potential uh, future directions might be. So before I get started, let me um, ask, how many classroom teachers are here this morning? Classroom teachers, okay. And how many of you are in elementary? And how many of you are secondary? So I'm going to talk about some final, well, mostly in the breakout afterwards. There's some differences between, as you know, I'm going to be secondary, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, how many of you are ELD or ESL special? Uh, parent, any parents or community members? Right. Uh, administrators. And how many of your school site administrators? Okay. And how about district office administrators? Okay. How about psychologists, counselors, other support? Okay. Uh, it's good to see you. Where, where did you use the conference at Syracuse last year? I'm going to try not to repeat too well. I'm going to repeat a bunch of stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to go over the stuff that I repeat very quickly. But no one's here, so I can talk. <laughs> okay, great. So let's just set the stage. Um, I think it's always useful to begin with first principles. Uh, and the first principle here is figuring out who are English language learners. As you know, the names have changed over the years. When I got into education, it was less less. Literate English speaking, non-English speaking. Uh, then it became less. Literate English proficient. Uh, before that, it was ESL students or bilingual students. Uh, more recently, uh, dual language learners have become much more prevalent. In fact, we have some change in the legislation at the national level. Um, but the, the term that's most commonly used is English language learners. And one thing that's interesting about education, uh, I hope this is not an invidious comparison, but education is a little bit like the military. We really like our acronyms. And we sit and we swim in this sort of acronym alphabet suit. And sometimes the names and the acronyms change, but the underlying reality really doesn't. 
So that the challenges that limited English proficient English language learners, ESL, less, less, bilingual ESL students, whatever you call them, the challenges that they present to our schools and the challenges that our schools present to them have really not changed that much in the 30, 40, 50 years um, that we've been aware of them as a population of students. So who are English language learners? Well, in the simplest terms, there are students who are not sufficiently proficient in English to better the adequate for mainstream instruction. Right? That's sort of the, the bottom line definition. They're not sufficiently proficient to benefit from mainstream instruction. <laughs> And by law, by, by constitutional principle, by court decisions, by legislation, something needs to be done to give them access to the content of the core curriculum. Now, the law doesn't prescribe what you have to do, and a couple of states have prescribed what you can't do, and I'll get to that in a few minutes, but there's students for whom we have to do something. Sink or swim is literally illegal. So even if morally you were okay, or educationally or professionally, you were okay with sink or swim because you think that's what the best for the children. Some people might believe that. You can't do it because it's literally illegal. You have to do something to give them access to core curriculum. You buy new education, you show instruction. You have options legally, but you can't do nothing. That is not an option. So what's the EL population like? Well, as you probably know, as you heard from Janina, it's large, it's growing, it's diverse. It's more than 10% of the school age population in the US, which is near here in New York, about 5 million US na na nationwide. Uh, they're 10% of the school age population, 5 million students are English language learners. There are actually far more students who come from a home or a language other than English is spoken. We have about 10 million students who come from a home where something other than English is spoken, but not all of those are English language learners. English language learners are the ones who do not have enough proficiency in English. Just because you come from a home, where a language other than English is spoken does not mean you're an English language learner. You're an English language learner if you lack sufficient proficiency to benefit from ancient instruction. So, as you probably know, 80% of ELs are Latinos, uh, mostly from Mexico, but also Central America, a smattering from other parts of Latin America. Uh, 8 to 10% are Asian, of Asian origin, Asian descent, and there are dozens of other languages. Does anyone know how many different languages the U.S. K-12 population speaks, students come from home? How many languages? Anyone want to take a guess? I'm very normal. 30? A little higher. 400. There are 400 different languages spoken by students in our K-12 population. Now, some of these are very low incidence languages, Sure. But there's a lot of them. And increasingly, I mean, since I got an education some years ago, it used to be that English language learners were sort of located, or at least we're aware of them, along the south, you know, from Florida to Texas, Arizona, actually not from Florida, Florida, and then you skip over the southeast United States, except for Florida. Now, Georgia, Alabama, uh, South Carolina, which one of the areas with the greatest number of growth in the Alps. So you had Florida, then you had Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, and then maybe some in New York, and mostly Puerto Rican, and maybe some in Chicago, and basically that was it. Now there is hardly a teacher in the country who doesn't come across English language learners at some point in their career, and some people have their entire careers uh, educating and teaching English language learners. So it's become quite a reality uh, in the school topography. Now, English language learners tend to be of lower socioeconomic status, but it varies greatly within and between language and ethnic groups. One of the generalizations you can make about English language learners, aside from the fact that you don't speak English well enough to benefit from mainstream instruction, is it's hard to make generalizations about them. They have lots of different languages, they have lots of different ethnic and linguistic origins, their socioeconomic status is very diverse, even within the same language or ethnic group. So there's a tremendous amount of diversity these populations. I don't really talk about the ELL population, it's really more ELL population plural. So my plan for today is to, first of all, review some key aspects of the research on ELLs. Now, I just should tell you ahead of time, after my talk, the PowerPoint will be posted on the Ed Terra, uh, Terra Ed website. Um, so please don't feel like you can furiously write down 
uh, even if you're interested in what I'm saying, don't feel like you have to write everything down because they will be available. So these are just a number of publications that, that, I, that I will draw on. A couple of these are in your, uh, in your packets, in your folders. The one on, on locking your research on English language learners is sort of a summary or a synthesis of the research in this area. Um, in the second one, guidelines for English language uh, development is something that would be of particular interest to you. If you are in the early childhood world, which I suspect there is anyone here in the early childhood? Anyone the only three, four year olds, five year olds? So, anyway, if you're interested in those, those the last two you can do in the childhood. The, the first two are in your packet, um, and you can download them for free at this website. Closer? Oh. Okay. Is that Sorry about that. Um, so you can download them for free from the website. Uh, they're interested in the public domain. So what I'm going to do is uh, try to review with you briefly uh, some key aspects of research, um, and then I'm going to include some uh, important recent findings that that I think really merit some some attention. Uh, then I'll discuss some of our challenges and opportunities going forward. And then finally, after the keynote, those of you who are particularly interested in going into some detail on two or three of the key studies, uh, we'll, we'll do that afterwards in the breakout. Um, and if you are interested in going into depth, I mean, necessarily, my discussion is going to be somewhat superficial. A lot of times people are interested, well, how did you reach those conclusions? What, what really are the data that support the conclusions that, that you're claiming? So those of you who are interested in this level of detail, I would invite you to uh, uh, join us, join me in the, uh, the breakout, you know. So, what do we know from the research about effective practices for English learners? Well, historically, the EL research has been dominated by the language of instruction debate, otherwise known as bilingual education. Bilingual education, bilingual education, for or against, has been the most controversial, contentious, and difficult issue in this whole field for the past 40, 50 years at least since the time of the civil rights period. And as a result of this, it's been strongly ideological. The research on English language learners is very ideological. Things are changing, as I'll tell you in a few minutes, but it's understandable that it's ideological, because honestly, modern bilingual education, bilingual education is a part of the American educational landscape since colonial times. This might shock many of you, but bilingual education is a part of American education Forever, with a very brief exception during World War I and afterwards, there was a tremendous amount of nationalism and anti-immigrant, anti-foreigner sentiment. But it's always been part of the American landscape. But in the 1960s, during the Civil Rights Movement, bilingual education became a political cause because so many students, from primarily of, of Mexican descent at the time, but it was more than just that, so many students were having a difficult time making it to school. It became a civil rights issue. So modern bilingual education really started in the 1960s under highly charged political and ideological conditions. So it's understandable that it's taken on this, this character. Now, as a result of the dominance of bilingual education and those ideological and political struggles, there's been surprisingly little research and very sparse data and findings on very important topics, such as accelerating English language development. This might shock you, but it wasn't until a handful of years ago, no more than 10 years ago, that actually someone did a study that posed the question, can we accelerate the pace of acquisition of English as a second language? The rule of thumb, as you know, as you might not know in our field, is it takes from five to seven years to achieve proficiency in English, sometimes as long as 10 years. Now, is that a physical reality, like the speed of light? I mean, theoretically, you cannot exceed the speed of light. I know all you science speakers know this. You cannot exceed the speed of light. It can't be done. Now, someday, someone might overturn that, just like Newtonian physics was overturned. But at the moment, it's like, a, it's like a cosmic speed limit. So is the same true of the amount of time it takes to become proficient in second language, that five or seven years rule of thumb? Is that sort of a hardwired physical reality? But we really don't know. And not until fairly recently did actually someone do a study to say, can we accelerate the pace of the time of development? So this is one of the fallouts of this highly charged political environment in which bilingual education and the education of ELLs emerge. 
So portions of the research have been insufficiently attention just to the outcome, paid insufficient attention to the outcome. This is something else that shocks a lot of people. You would think there'd be lots of research looking at the benefits or the disadvantages of doing this versus that. But in reality, it's been only recently that we've paid attention to outcomes, except for bilingual education. There's been a focus on outcomes in bilingual education for the past 30, 40 years. Some of those studies are good, some of those studies are bad, but at least people knew that you have to, you have to try different things and see what the benefit of one or the other is. Not so for many other areas. Descriptive studies, and I don't get me wrong, I believe in descriptive studies. I mean, my dissertation was a qualitative, quasi-ethnographic study, so I've got nothing against that style of research. But you need some studies that look at outcomes, that look at what happens if you do this versus that. And until fairly recent, recently, there was very, very good results. So as, as a result of all of this, the research on English language learners until fairly recently has been difficult to use as the basis for policy and practice. Now, I'm happy to say the research base is changing over the past 10, 15 years, I'd say. Uh, research, there's research consensus on some issues, which I will share with you. Uh, there's more research looking at student outcomes, which I will also share with you. Uh, and language instruction is not as dominant in the research. Now, language instruction is important, don't get me wrong. I don't mean to diminish or dismiss its importance, but it is not the only thing that affects the achievement of English language learners. It is not the only thing. And the fact that it's not so dominant, I think, is a good thing because we're realizing there are lots of other issues besides what language we educate these, these children in. Uh, we're also looking at effective practices for ELLs and non-ELLs. I think we're coming to understand, sometimes reluctantly, sometimes willingly, that ELLs and non-ELLs are not two different species of creatures. They don't belong to different genus, five and so on and so on and so forth. They are part of the same human race, and as a result, they share certain characteristics. There are certain things that humans do or don't do as a function of different conditions of learning. And ELLs, just like non-ELLs, are part of the general human species, and we need to learn from how non-ELLs learn. And there's a lot we don't know about how non-ELLs learn. And a lot of that, surprisingly or not, applies to ELL, so I'll get into all of that. Okay, I've been talking long enough, you ready for quiz? Correct answer is yes. <laughs> so here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna start off, I'd like you to take a piece of paper, or you can use a blank document, you know, if you'd like to use your computer. Um, I know you just won't be multitasking, so you won't have much to So take a piece of paper or a blank document, and I'm going to do one like so. And then make room for notes. And then don't get nervous, but the bottom right final is bad. You can run on the back. No one's nervous. I'm an easy to do. Okay? So here we have quiz number one. Quiz question number one. And here's the step. Yeah. Teaching ELLs and teaching non-ELLs in English require fundamentally different skill sets. And your options are true, false, or más o menos. Más o menos in my country from Argentina originally. Well, más o menos means more or less. Anyone here speak Hebrew? I don't know if that's all, but that's, that's it for my local language. So true, false, or más o menos. And then discuss. You gotta have this stuff. This is all important. Language is learning. So teaching ELLs and teaching non-ELLs are fundamental different skill sets. Two faults, not minnows. Choose one and then discuss with your health department.
how much overlap there is between effective practices for ELs and non-ELs. You will get disagreements about this. So let me just emphasize that this is my reading of the data. So the key finding in research, in my mind, first one, is that components of effective instruction in general also apply to English learning. There's a vast literature on effective teaching practices. It's not definitive by any means, but it is vast and is robust. Findings are routinely confirmed and reconfirmed by teachers in classrooms and by researchers doing whatever researchers do. So here are some of the things that, in general, we know is a fair amount of confidence you know, is helpful for learners. There are no guarantees in education, as we know. But these are things that tend to be helpful. And if you do these kinds of things, it helps learners learn. Having clear goals and objectives, uh, having appropriate and challenging material, having well-designed instruction and instructional routine, having clear input and models, active engagement and participation, informative feedback, application of new learning, practice and periodic review, interaction with other students, frequent assessments that new teaching is needed. Right? These are things that there, there's a vast literature on. Now, how you apply it, under what circumstances, that's where the, the art of teaching comes in. We know there's a scientific basis to the art of teaching, just like there's a scientific basis to the art of medicine, scientific basis to the art of architecture, right? There's certain scientific truths, and when I say truths, I don't mean 100%, but I mean probabilities. If you include these components in your instruction, you are by and large going to be a more effective instructor. Now, this is true in general, but it's also true specifically for ELLs. All studies demonstrating positive effects on English learners' achievement uses at least several of these features. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, one study that I reviewed was compared structured writing instruction, for, this is all for ELLs, compared structured writing instruction with a teacher writing instruction, error correction, feedback, skill building, to free writing. Guess students in which group improved their writing? Well, the kids in the structured writing. Now, this should not shock anyone. So I say, well, okay, why are you warning us? With it? Well, the reason I'm warning you with this is that for ELs, it's just as true that instruction, error correction, feedback, and skill building is effective as it is for kids who are not ELs. So I don't want to belabor it, but I just want to make clear that we have a lot of knowledge about effective instruction that I find we systematically just dismiss or ignore or forget about because we think that ELs require a fundamentally different kind of teaching. So here's another example. Um, one review, this is actually from a review of research done by Bob Slade and his colleagues, and they found that interventions that they studied have similar effects on both ELs and non-ELs, and they concluded that programs with strong evidence of effectiveness were effective with students in general and then modified for English language learning. So the core components, which had one or more of these elements that we talked about, the core components were the same, but they required some modification for the elements. And then finally, the last example I'll give you is a study that was done looking at teachers who were effective with ELs, and this is effective in terms of student achievement. It was a, a value added. Are you all familiar with value added measures? It's become very controversial in some areas. Los Angeles, people go nuts. Value added, and we'll talk about the breakout. I'm not going to specifically talk about the study. And they, they compare teachers who on value added measures were effective with ELs and teachers on value added measures were effective with non ELs. And they found a tremendous overlap between the two groups of teachers. And the conclusion was teachers who were effective with ELs and non ELs also tend to be effective with the other group. And if you're particularly interested in the study, which is a really important and interesting one, we'll talk more about it in the breakout. So all of this leads me to pose my next quiz item, which is this. Good teaching for ELs is just good teaching. True, false, más o menos, and discuss.
programs with strong incentives effectiveness more effective with students in general than modified with ELs. Right? That should kind of tip you off that they're not equally effective. There are some things. Remember what is particularly what is the defining characteristic of English language learners? They lack sufficient proficiency to benefit from mainstream instruction by definition. Which, which suggests, and the evidence corroborates it, that you need additional, you need some modifications. So it can't be just good teaching. They require additional modifications. So what might those modifications, or what might that support include? Well, one might be language and content objectives, which is one of the hallmarks of it. How many people are familiar with the SIOC model? Shelf and Instruction Operation. Okay. Great. So that's one of the characteristics of the SIOC. You have language objectives and content objectives because English learners lack sufficient language proficiency, and one of the ways to help them acquire that is to teach the language that's necessary to engage and benefit and understand mainstream instruction. Right? I mean, that, that would be the, the logical inference, right? Um, pictures, demonstrations, realia, you know, redundant cues, things that do not require linguistic input to be able to understand is another possible support. Uh, a category of those are graphic organizers, behaviorals, webs, then diagrams. Now what these all have in common is that they <coughs> assume, they realize, they're, they're based on the assumption that purely linguistic input is not going to be sufficient for English language because they're English language lack of proficiency. So you need additional support for those sorts of things. In which context, videos, multimedia, have been, uh, have been studied. Um, materials with familiar content, cultural uh, or background knowledge, we know influences comprehension. So material with familiar content is going to be useful for helping them understand the material, the content. Um, there's also strategic support of L1, uh, first language, such as cognates, other kinds of L1 support. Uh, extra practice and time, might be part of the additional support. Uh, differentiating instruction by language proficiency might be another way to provide additional support. Uh, very clear instructions and learning tasks. I mean, all students benefit from clear instructions, but English language learners might in particular. So this, this whole group of supports are sometimes called sheltered instruction. And the SIOP model uh, really brought together of uh, uh, several dozen of these sort of strategies in sort of a coherent workable model. Um, and I, I covered these findings in, in the first of the, the two papers on you know, the basis for English language learner instruction. So these are some possible supports, right, that make a certain amount of sense. But here's a caveat, and this might surprise you. The research is surprisingly sparse on these supports. Uh, for starters, the SIOP which honestly I think is really the best sheltered model out there. There's small to nil effects, right? The, the effects of the PSYOP have really not been uh, demonstrated in any, in any convincing way. Uh, through one study with very small results, with very small results, one study included the analysis only teachers who have implemented it correctly, which is a major design problem. Uh, the most recent study had small but non-significant results. Um, so the PSYOP, as useful as it is by bringing these together, there really is lack of a robust research base that it actually gets the intended or desired results. Um, a recent study, how many people are familiar with GLAD, divided language acquisition uh, development? It's more of an elementary kind of program. Uh, it, all, it has some very interesting ideas, some very useful scaffolds and templates, but um, there's, there's been only one study, and it found some modest results the first year, which then unfortunately washed away the second year, but at least it's been studied. The problem is that a lot of programs have no evaluations, have, or there are no effects. So it's, it's quite surprising when you look at sort of models of instruction designed specifically for English language learners, there's really very little evidence on any of those. Now, I'm not saying they're bad, I'm not saying they don't work. I'm just telling you there's really insufficient research that, that claims that they have any effects on, on student learning. Um, now, we have a large literature on graphic organizers for all students, right? 
which is fine, but it's not ELL specific. I mean, anyone nowadays who teaches just with a stream of verbal input is really ignoring a lot that we know about the need for visual, the need for redundant information, but all students benefit from that. Now, it could be that ELs benefit more than other students than not ELs, but so far there's no evidence of that either. Um, we know that using familiar content promotes comprehension, and there have been several studies, uh, some of them I reviewed for the National Literacy Panel, that for limited, limited speaking, and this is actually a worldwide finding, there are studies in Canada, studies in Africa, that second language learners really benefit from having the material that they're reading in the second language, but familiar content. Now, whether it's culturally familiar, or familiar because they grew up knowing it, or familiar because they were taught it, that's a different story. There are different ways of making things familiar. It's not just culturally familiar. But if you know the content, even though you're reading in the second language, it's more accessible to you. So I think that's a pretty robust finding that, that merits, definitely merits use. Uh, we have some good studies, well, at least one, on the importance of enriched content, context. The use of videos and multimedia sort of resources to help students. Um, it was a very good study. You might be interested in this because it's in science, although it was only with K-1-2 students. So in secondary, you can say, well, this, this doesn't apply to me. I would suggest that it does apply to you. In the classrooms that I've been in that did not use multimedia or videos that are very easily accessible nowadays because of the internet. You know, some years ago, it really took a lot of effort to gin up some video content I mean, if you want to illustrate a thought or anything you want to illustrate, you go on the internet and you can find it incredibly quickly. And for English learners, this is probably one of the most powerful things that we can use to illustrate concepts and help them understand not only vocabulary, but important ideas that are abstract and difficult to understand. So this one I think I have a fair amount of confidence in. Um, there's also positive evidence for L1 support. Uh, I'm going to talk in a few minutes about the difference between L1 instruction and L1 support. Students who are in English only instruction but can be supported using their first language by, by previewing the content of the first language and then doing the instruction in English and then sometimes reviewing in the first language. That can be useful. Use of cognitive, use of uh, quick definitions. Uh, redundant cues, pictures, realia, providing extra time. You know, they all make sense, but as far as I can tell, there's really no clear evidence that they make much of a difference. The big question is really this one. Can any group of instructional practices help PLs keep up with non -work? And at the moment, we really don't have any evidence that they can. We have some ideas for some potentially effective development strategies. None of the comprehensive programs really have a robust research base. So we have a lot of work to do. If we're really going to try to figure out, implement, and evaluate strategies that will actually help English language learners keep up with their non-ELL colleagues. This is the big challenge for us as a field. So, let's review. I think that the first important finding, the first important takeaway, is that components of effective instruction in general also apply to English learners. And I would say, unequivocally, the foundation of effective PL instruction is very similar to the foundation for effective instruction, period. Right? If you're not using clear goals and objectives, if you're not using clear instruction, if you don't have well-designed instructional routines, if you're not reviewing, if you're not assessing, if you're not engaging students with each other, with the teacher, with the material, if you're not doing these things, which we know from the research base in general, if you're not doing these things, then you cannot have effective instruction for PL. It's the foundation of effective instruction. But at the same time, additional supports are necessary due to limited English proficiency. It's not just good teaching. It's good teaching plus a lot of things. Okay, so let's go to quiz question number three. And it says follows. Exposing yourself to a rich English language environment is generally sufficient for them to learn English and be successful in school. True? Yeah. False. Master Mingo. And discuss.
Okay, well, you know, how many people think must be in That was fairly unanimous. All right, you all got it right. It is definitely false. Uh, you know, ELD needs to be taught explicitly. But there's no single model or approach that's sufficient. One of the characteristics of ELD, this field, ELD in general, but ELD specifically, is that there's a wide range of perspectives and theories. Now, certainly, ELs need access to a rich English language environment. I mean, there's absolutely no question of that. All students should have access to a rich language environment. But it's unlikely to be sufficient. English learners need structured, explicit language learning opportunities that help them acquire the sorts of English skills that are required for success in academic environments. In addition to a rich language environment where they're using language meaningfully, communicatively, authentically. It's not one or the other. Now, we have different emphases and different issues. And if you're particularly interested in this, I would recommend to you the second article in your packet on guidelines for English language development. Let me just mention a couple of them. One issue is communicative language teaching versus teaching formal aspects of language. One of the big debates in language learning for a long time has been how do we best learn a language? Do we learn it by using it authentically, communicatively, in a way that's unique, the way, or by teaching and learning formal aspects of language, aka grammar, aka syntax? It's a kind of traditional way. But it's an ongoing debate. Do you learn a language by using it communicatively or by learning formal aspects? Now, my reading of research is that you need both. It's one not exclusive of the other. Another issue that with comprehensible input versus output. Many of you know the name Steve Kraft, probably the most important applied linguist of the late 20th century. And he was one of the things he was famous for was the comprehensible input hypothesis, which said that you learn a second language by hearing lots of comprehensible input. He completely downplayed the importance of output, completely dismissed the importance of formal study of the language. It was all about comprehensible input. So now the question is, is comprehensible input enough? Or you also need to begin to make comprehensible output. You need to be engaging in two-way conversations. And my reading of the evidence is you need both. Then the question of do you focus on language or do you focus on content? Now typically an ESL class or ELD class focuses on the language that you're learning. The forms, functions, structures, grammars, and so forth. But the alternative perspective is no, you want to focus on content, things that are interesting. The focus on content goes along with the communicative approach. Right, we want to focus on something interesting, worth learning, and the language sort of comes along. And again, I see no reason to be mutually exclusive. Both have their role. And then, and then the last thing I'll talk about is do you provide feedback or do you not provide feedback? Do you provide feedback to help them formalize so they don't fossilize aspects of language that are non-native or non-canonical? Or do you not provide feedback because it disparages students? Interferes with communication. And I think we have some evidence that suggests that you need to do some of both. There's some time when you need to provide feedback, and learners want the feedback. And other times you're providing excessive feedback just breaks down communication. Now, where that dividing line is and what the balance is, I think that's really one of the cutting edges in this particular field. The artful use of feedback so that it contributes to language learning rather than breaks down communication and interferes with language learning. Now, right now, we have very little data on what type of ELD instruction is most beneficial for, beneficial for ELs. I think we can conclude that lots of things are necessary. I think it's safe to conclude that there is no one comprehensive theory that really takes care of everything. But at the moment, we need to be, I believe, very ecumenical in our approach. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of details about guidelines. We can read that article. Let me just share with you a book I came across recently um, that I think is just completely fascinating, 25 centuries of language teaching. And anyone interested in language teaching should really dip into this book. Maybe not read it cover to cover, but read chunks here and there. Because the main takeaway for me was that all of our debates about language teaching have their roots that are at least 2,500 years old. There's really very little that is new. The natural approach, the direct approach, how language is acquired. I mean, these things, these are things that people have been struggling with 
for a long, long time. We're not the first people to discover these issues and worry about them. And the author, um, I.G. Kelly, had sort of an interesting, you know that saying that people who ignore history are destined to repeat it? Well, he had sort of a, a similar caveat for us teachers. Is that teachers being cursed with the assumption that their discoveries are necessarily an improvement on what went on before are reluctant to learn from history. And, and it's true. I mean, I think all of us are recalling this crap. We get tired of the old thing, it's old, it's traditional. I want to do something new, something different, something exciting. And I'm not against something new, different, exciting. But just because it's new doesn't mean it's better. Right? And we ignore the, the wisdom of practices. But we ignore the idea that the people have thought about these things, these things for a long time at our own peril. So I would just leave you on this particular topic with this reminder. And if you take nothing away from this part of the talk other than this, keep this in mind. Second language learners need to have lots of opportunity for authentic, motivated, and engaging interactions in the target language. But they also benefit from direct teaching, from feedback, and structured practice on targeted forms and functions. It is not a dichotomy. It is not to do one or the other. OK, last quiz question before the final exam, which I'm going to cut short to. We're not trying to. We'd love to have So the fourth question is this one. And we're going to talk about the great bilingual education issue for the last few minutes. Use of the L1 from classroom instruction can make a positive contribution to PL's academic development. True, false, and false. Some people say true. Some okay. people think false. There's no orthodoxy here. There's just insertion data. How many people think muscle memory? A little skeptical. Um, the answer is true. Again, let me emphasize my answer is true. Uh, but I think it's backed by research, so I feel very confident. All these answers are backed by research, so I feel very confident in them. Um, and it's true. But, but the evidence really is quite a bit more tenuous than you might think. And you might think, if you're a big bilingual education opponent, and that you might suspect that you're skeptical about bilingual education. So, so here's key finding number four from the research. L1 instruction can promote L2 reading achievement, bilingualism, and longer term school success. Um, there have now been six meta analyses, which are quantitative syntheses of research, mostly of experimental research. Well, all of these are experimental studies. There have been six meta analyses, and they've all concluded that teaching children to read in their first language can help promote literacy in the second language. Now, the effect sizes are small to moderate, so this is not something overwhelming, but they're real. Right? Small to moderate effect size here, small to moderate effect size there, pretty soon get the big effect size. So, this is something important to pay attention to. Not surprisingly, L1 instruction promotes L1 skills. That shouldn't shock anyone, but it's still true. A recent study, and I'll be talking about this in the breakout for the review, a recent study found no differences in English achievement, but effects on Spanish achievement. So what you have there is a net gain. There's no loss in terms of English, but there is a, a gain in terms of primary language instruction. Now, whether that's important or valuable will depend on your perspective. I really think maintaining and developing the primary language is a useful thing. Now, I happen to believe that. If you believe that bilingualism is a good thing, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So there's a net gain from bilingual education, and no significant loss in English. So at worst, at worst, my synthesis of the research is that L1 instruction promotes L1 skill without negative effects on L2 achievement. That's like the worst case scenario. Okay. Now, all the experimental studies lasted two or three years, so there's really inconclusive data on the length of time. Are you better off doing bilingual education for four years, for two years? We really don't know. But a recent, very good study, it's a retrospective study, but very well controlled, found long-term effects of dual language programs. From the beginning of school, children in the school to about 11th grade. 
I'll talk more about this in the breakout. I think it's worth paying attention to. As you might imagine, it has some nuances and complexities, but it is it's really the best study that's been done to date on the long-term effects. Even though it's not prospective, it's retrospective, which has some issues, but it's a very well-controlled study. So I think we can find not only the L1, this is about L1 instruction, bilingual education, but we also find support for L1 support that can be helpful in English immersion environment. And by L1 support, you're not instructing in the L1, but you are using the L1 to sort of scaffold and bootstrap acquisition of L2 knowledge and skills. Uh, we have some evidence that COD makes are helpful, geography or geografia. You know, there's no direct experimental evidence that they help, but there's some clearly suggestion that pointing out cognates is helpful. But you want to be careful, I don't want to be speak Spanish, you want to be careful, there's some things called false cognates, which are always my favorites. For example, the Spanish word for embarrassed is not embarazada. <laughs> but I saw was pregnant, so if you wouldn't want to light up a room with adolescents, oh, it was so embarazado is what happened. It's a different word, so it's a false target. Wear a false target. Then uh, there's a brief explanation of the home language. Not code switching, right? Not doing simultaneous translation, but brief explanations of key concepts in the home language can be helpful. Um, there's something that I mentioned before called preview review, where you Preview the content in L1, and then there's a L1 review following the lesson, but the body of the lesson is done in the second line. So maybe key concepts and key vocabulary are reviewed or previewed in review. Uh, you can teach comprehension or learning strategies in the language and then apply it to L2. So these are ways you provide L1 support. Okay, this is going to be really quick, the final exam, because we are running out of time. A couple of points I want to make. And then here's the question of the final exam. You can just think you can write it down if you want. What are the key takeaways from the research on English learners? What are the key takeaways? Now, I said don't cheat. What's the next page? But I thought you were going to have this PowerPoint. So I'm going to worry about it. Anyway. Team is cheating, so I'll just go down. Just jot it down. Discuss briefly. Um, and we'll just take just, just two minutes because we're not have enough time. Just give you a chance to think about it. Massachusetts, in California, there's a, a ballot uh, on the 
ballot, on the November ballot, is a proposition basically overturning Proposition 227, which pla pla placed enormous restrictions on public education. I understand why, I understand motivation, I don't think necessarily run on or his minions or motivated by xenophobia or anything with red sentiment. I think there's reason to be skeptical about the educational program providing English learners. But eliminating the use of primary language is not a path forward. So we have to align our research, our policies, and our practices. We also have to balance ideology and strongly held beliefs with the need for, to demonstrate effectiveness. I mean, there's a reason this is ideological, and I understand it, you know. It's a very personal set, you know, what land is being used, you know, my home language, the language of the country. The United States technically doesn't have an official language, but by and large, English is the lingua franca, English is the lingua franca, right? It's a language that if you don't have facility with, if you're not proficient in, you will be disadvantaged. There's no question about it. So the need to reach high levels of English proficiency is indisputable. But we've got to move beyond the ideology of it, you know, the politics of it, strongly felt beliefs, and think about okay, what's really going to benefit students. And the second language, the home language of students, has got to be part of the mix. I mean, the evidence just points unequivocally towards that. Uh, we also have to build coherent school-wide programs. Teachers cannot, on their own, implement these policies and practices. It, it just, it's just too much. They have to be supported at the school level, at the district level, to implement the kind of practices that these groups support, and to look for more and more and more effective practices. It's got to be a school-wide, district-wide effort. It can't be classroom by classroom. And then we have to take advantage of the language skills of an increasingly diverse population by expanding two-way bilingual programs. There's no question in my mind that we'd be better off if we were a multilingual bilingual society and join the rest of the world. Now, I'm going to skip over a bunch of these other things if there's no time, but if you're interested in this topic of bilingual education and historical antecedents to bilingual education in the United States, and by bilingual education, I'm talking about really bilingual education, where not just English learners get taught in their own language as a scaffold or a bootstrap in English, but really when we make a national policy, just like we have a national policy, everybody learns math, everyone learns literature, everyone learns science, everyone learns geography, to one degree or another. We need to become a bilingual, at least, society. It is an American tradition, and a student of mine and I, uh, last year, published an article in the American Educator that talks about reviving this American tradition of bilingual education. Our discussions on bilingual education are staggeringly in the story. People do not realize the antecedents that exist. They only think about the politics of it and the ideology of it and the shouting past each other of it. If you're interested in this topic, I strongly suggest here's the, uh, the website, and it will be on the PowerPoint, uh, that you look into this. Because we have to have a more historical perspective. Uh, remember what they said about people who ignore history are going to repeat it? But we're just going to be repeating the same old, stale, empty, debates about the language and instruction. If we don't pay attention to where we're going and where we're going. We're going towards a multilingual world, a bilingual world. The United States has to choose to be part of that world or maintain its linguistic parochialism. And with that ideological pitch, thank you very much.